It don't last very long. Because it's got this higher energy, and there's still an attraction between the electron and the nucleus, the electron, if it had feelings, really wants to go back closer to the nucleus for this stronger attraction. So what we have now is a situation where we have potential energy. Okay, so we have this higher energy state. So if I lift a book up onto the table, that's potential energy. I knock it off. That creates kinetic energy. So we have this state of potential energy here. Now, usually, um, the color we see from an object. So if you see anything that's colored, so like my blue shirt. The reason my shirt is blue is because my shirt is absorbing all the colors except the blue wavelength. So it's not absorbing the blue, it's absorbing all the other colors and it's reflecting the blue wavelength. Right? So what happens to all that energy my shirt is absorbing? Well, it's converting it to heat. Okay, so when most, most times when molecules absorb energy, it gets, it gets converted to what we call in chemistry vibrational energy which we all refer to as heat. So it just turns into vibrations, it turns into heat. Okay? So that's kind of wasted energy. So if you see a white color, white means all the wavelengths of light are reflected, just like the sun's light. Okay? And if you see black, that means all of the wavelengths of light are absorbed by that thing. Now, a few years ago, the pointers played Platteville, and I was at the game, and it was really hot and really sunny. And the first thing that stuck out to me as a chemist as I was preparing talks, as the pointers were wearing black uniforms, Platteville was wearing white uniforms, and it made a big difference in how hot they were getting, I'm sure, because the pointers' uniforms were absorbing all the sun's energy and converting it to heat. Platteville's were reflecting all of the sun's energies and not converting that to heat. And then we lost that game. And I'll blame it on the uniforms as a chemist <laughs> and, and as a pointer fan. Now, the challenge in trapping this energy is that these excited states are very short-lived, so nanoseconds, so really, really short. So the energy comes in, promotes the electron, that energy is given off right away as vibrational energy. So the challenge in this is trying to trap this energy, and then not only to trap it, to use it, but we want to store it, because one of the big questions that always arises when you talk about solar energy, solar electric energy, is what do we do when the sun's not out? Uh, and so we need to be able to take that energy and store it. And that's exactly what happens in photosynthesis, right? It, it takes that energy, it uses it to convert one molecule to another, it stores it as chemical energy. So that's the kind of thing we would like to do, is store energy. Now, here's my best description of how photosynthesis works. So what happens is photosynthesis has all these chlorophyll molecules in the vicinity of each other, and then cl one chlorophyll molecule will absorb the light, and that will go into the excited state. And they could either come back down, relax, and just regenerate heat, or that energy can get transferred to the next chlorophyll molecule, which gets transferred until it eventually finds a different kind of chlorophyll molecule, which is called a reaction center. The reaction center is the place where the CO2 and the, well, at least the start of the process where CO2 and water get converted to the carbohydrates, so it gets converted to chemical energy. So my analogy for this is it's like a bucket brigade. Okay, the first one absorbs it and it keeps passing it along until it gets to the reaction center and then that's where the productive things happen. The process of this, I mean, photosynthesis is pretty amazing. The process is it converts almost 100% of the light it absorbs by these chlorophyll molecules into this chemical energy, which is just amazing um, from a chemical standpoint. So there's really three steps involved in the photosynthetic process. First, we've got to absorb the light. And we call that light harvesting when you're talking about creating energy or absorbing energy, I guess. Then that energy has to be transferred um, from one molecule to the next until it gets to a productive site where chemistry can happen, where you can store that energy. And then once it gets there, you have to figure out a way to store it. Now, when you talk about light absorption, light harvesting, there's chlorophyll molecules are great at doing this. There's hundreds, thousands, millions maybe, probably not millions, but there's thousands of molecules that synthetic chemists can design that mimic chlorophyll's ability to absorb light. So synthetically, this is not that challenging to make molecules that harvest light. Storing it is another research area. Um, it's not my research area, but lots of chemists, have tried to, chemists and engineers have tried to figure out ways to store the sun's energy and solar electrical energy. One of the big things we'd like to do is model what photosynthetic systems do and take that energy and convert it into chemical energy. So take 
CO2, which is a gas that we all know is we'd like to get rid of more CO2, use the sun's energy to convert that CO2 into methanol, which we could then burn as fuel, creating more CO2, and then we have the cyclical process. So, and that's doable, and there's been a lot of uh, recent literature in that, a lot of recent developments in that field. The area I'm most interested in, and maybe the most challenging, I'll sell it as the most challenging because that's my research field, is transferring the energy. How do we get it to transfer the energy? I told you chlorophyll molecules can transfer almost 100% of the energy and get it to that reaction center. And that's not so easy. So when we ask the question, how are we going to do this, we can go back to our bucket brigade analogy and say, what do we need to have an effective bucket brigade to get energy passed from one to the next? Well, your bucket passers, so to speak, have to be close enough to transfer the buckets. You can't have one guy standing here and another guy at the end of the block and passing buckets. They have to be right next to each other. Okay? The next thing is the bucket pack, they have to be in proper position. So if I have one person standing like this and one person standing like this next to them, they're not going to be able to pass the buckets. So we have to position the molecules so that they're able to transfer the energy. And then they must be willing or able to transfer the buckets. So I can line up a bunch of two-year-olds, and that's not going to be a, an effective bucket brigade. So I need to make sure the molecules I put in my bucket brigade, so to speak, are capable of transferring that energy. So our answer to this, and this is what we'll talk about most of the rest of the time, is we want to design molecules that stack on top of each other. But not only do they have to stack on top of each other, they have to align in such a way that they transfer an energy from one molecule to the next in this bucket brigade style. And this is what Chris was kind of describing in the introduction, is this is my field of interest, is trying to understand those interactions between molecules so we can control how they rest next to each other so we can get this kind of bucket brigade effect. But not only do we have to be able to control their orientation, we have to understand and create molecules that are capable of doing this, of passing this energy. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if they're in the proper orientation, if they're not willing or able to pass, well, they don't have feelings, but if they're not able to pass the electrons or the energy, it's a useless venture. Now, this is hard, because molecules are really, really small. You just can't take little tweezers and pick up one molecule and stack them on top of each other. They're too small for that. Nobody can see a molecule. You can't pick up a molecule. So how do you stack things on top of each other if you can't see them, right? if you can't push them around? And then, if we are able to stack them on top of each other, how do we get them to align themselves in the proper orientation? And so the answer to this is we've got to understand the forces that are responsible for that. If you have a bunch of molecules, if I have a molecule here and a molecule here, and they come together, how are they going to come together? Are they going to come together in a way they can transfer energy? Are they going to come together like this or this? What orientation are they going to come together? And are they going to be able to pass energy in between? So this is really my research field, is trying to understand these interactions. There's this concept in chemistry which is called, we call self-assembly. And that, the idea is, if I make a molecule and these ends are attracted to themselves, so other of similar ends, and I put a certain angle in the molecule, 120 degrees. So again, this is just a molecule. And like I told you about molecules before, if you give me a molecule, I can tell you, oh, this is probably how you would make that molecule. And so we're just talking about des designing individual molecules. And these are six identical molecules. But if the ends are attracted to each other, what will happen is these molecules will self-assemble into this hexagon structure. Because the angles that we put into there dictated that this is going to be the most stable arrangement of these molecules. So if we changed that angle to 90 degrees, we wouldn't get a hexagon, but we'd get a square. So what we can start to do is we can start to think about, I can go from an individual molecule to a bigger shape. So I can start to control how these molecules come together and what kind of shapes they form. And that's just what I said. Now the model for this, and one model for this in nature, is with DNA. DNA has different base pairs. And depending on the base pair, and I'm colorblind, so you can tell me what these colors are, but if these two are attracted to each other, then everywhere there is that color, there's going to be one of those colors. Is that blue and orange something? <laughs> I'm guessing. But these different base pairs are going to have different partners. So these are actually two individual molecules. 
you guys have heard the term of double helix when referring to DNA. There's one molecule here that has 12 base pairs, and then there's a molecule here that has 12 bases on it, and those sequences match up perfectly. Now you can think about this as being really tiny Velcro, except more complicated Velcro than anybody would ever make. Because the idea of Velcro is you have hooks on one side, you have loops on the other side, you put those together, the hooks overlap with the loops. The way DNA works is you have hooks interspersed with loops, okay? but on the other side of the strand of DNA, the other molecule, the hook, there has to be a hook for every loop on the other side. So everywhere there's a hook, there's a loop, everywhere there's a loop, there's a hook. And so these sequences have to match up perfectly to get these interactions, to get these molecules to bind to each other. Now, this, what happens is you don't have one strand that's made over here and this other strand made over here. The way this works is you have one strand that, ser strand that serves as a template strand, and you have these other individual tinier molecules floating around, and you have a hook over here, okay, so a loop's gonna be attracted to that, and then you have a, another hook, so another loop, and then a, hook, a loop, so another hook. And once those, get, those molecules come together because they're attracted to these other things, then you have some enzyme that sews those together to create the other chain. So this first chain serves as a template for the rest of them. So this is the idea of self-assembly. If we program some functional groups in there, then other molecules will come in in a specific alignment, and we, we can program the molecules to arrange themselves in a certain manner. Let's see. So one thing we've learned in the recent his, in recently about DNA is we've always been taught and that DNA is held together by this hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is just the hooks and loops I was just talking about. This Velcro that we're, so going from the attraction between these two, these two, these two, these two. What people have done fairly recently is they've taken a lot of those hydrogen bonds out and what they realize is the DNA molecule, the double helix is actually still stable even if you take those hydrogen bonds out. So there must be some stabilizing interaction in this direction where these things are stacking on top of each other. And that's the interaction that I'm interested in, is if these molecules are able to stack on top of each other, can we program that into the molecules we're interested in for photosynthesis, or for mimicking photosynthesis? So you can kind of think of this as bricks and mortar, where the, you have the mortar holding together the bricks vertically, and there's also a force holding them together horizontally as well. So this is what we're talking about. If we want to design a material, the bucket brigade material that can transfer energy from one molecule to the next, we want something that looks like this, where they're ordered, rather than this chaos over here where they're all disordered, where it would be very hard to predict how energy is going to get transferred from one molecule to the next. And the model we're using for that is the DNA molecule where we have the stacking of the bases on top of each other. Um, so we're using similar type molecules. Now here's where I get in the structure where you do have to pay attention a little bit. Well, you don't have to, you can ignore me. <laughs> it's happened before. Uh, so we have different types of molecules. And if you just want to look at these as single lines, and then we have some double lines here. So we call these single lines single bonds, and we have to call these double lines double bonds. And the types of structures I'm interested in are the ones where we have alternating single lines and double lines, single bonds and double bonds. And you can even expand that to have triple bonds alternated with single bonds and double bonds. And you don't really have to understand the structure too much. But what we found, and what I, what, not what I found, but what my postdoc advisor found is when they made this molecule, that these actually stack on top of each other and they form these tubes. And not only do they form these tubes, but there's interactions, attractions from the side where they form these parallel tubes. Okay? So the idea is you can take an individual molecule you can put it in solution and it will organize itself into these more complex structures. So this is how we're going to stack molecules together. So we're not going to take our little tweezers and stack the molecules on there. We're going to put, make a, a molecule that wants to stack on top of the next one so that we don't have to force them to stack on top of each other. So they automatically self-assemble so all the molecules stack together. Okay, so this has kind of been established. There's we're studying different molecules that have the same potential to stack on top of each other, but we forgot about that last criteria, is the molecules have to be willing to transfer electrons, right? They have to be conductive. They have to be able to 
can transfer that energy from one molecule to the next. So the question is, what types of molecules do this? Well, in, 2000, in the year 2000, the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, these researchers for the discovery and development of conductive polymers. Now, conductive, in this term, just means it's able to, able to transfer energy along the chain, just like we're talking about for these photosynthetic processes. The types of molecules that do this, as you can see, are single bonds alternating with double bonds. So the same types of molecules that stack on top of each other that I showed you on, these previous, on the previous slide are the types of molecules that are also able to transfer electrons. Okay, so this gives us a model. So we've got this ability to self-organize the structures and the individual molecules are conductive so they're able to transfer the electrons along the way. So that means we're smarter than nature, right? <laughs> no. Nature's chlorophyll molecules, we talked about what chlorophyll molecules to do and how, can do and how effective they are. If you look at the structure of the chlorophyll molecule, it has these alternating double and single bonds around the structure. Nature figured this out long before we did, that these alternating double bond and single bond structures are the way to get these molecules that are able to transfer energy in between each other and they're able to conduct electrons. Now interestingly, just to point out something we talked about earlier, these are chlorophyll molecules, so they absorb certain frequencies of light. So this means it absorbs light here, it absorbs light here. Where it doesn't absorb light is between 500 and 600 nanometers. Well, what do those wavelengths of light correspond to? That's green light, okay? So the light you see from a plant is the light it doesn't absorb. It's the, gr the green light is what's reflected from the plant, not what's absorbed by the plant. All right, so here we get to more structures. Uh, you can ignore the structures if you want. Um, and I, this is tongue-in-cheek solving the world's energy problems. So I'm a synthetic chemist. What I try to do is partner with people who are different types of chemists or material scientists who have the ability to make materials or understand materials. In this case, I collaborated with one of my colleagues, Jason Dacchioli, and he's interested in these paddle wheel structures where we have a quadruple bond between two metals. And you don't have to understand that structure. The reason we're interested in this is my structures are the type of structures that will stack on top of each other like we want, and they're conductive, so we can transfer electrons. But there's one feature that, that we're missing from my structures, and that's why we developed a collaboration, is the feature that we're missing is the excited state lifetime. Remember what I talked about before with the chlorophyll molecules? When that, mo when that electron gets excited, that energy gets dissipated as heat very quickly on the nanosecond time scale. So if you don't capture that energy immediately, it just dies away as heat, as what we would call wasted energy if you're talking about solar energy. So what we need to do in order to capture this energy better is find something with a longer excited state lifetime. So what happens is when this metal model quadruple bond functionality sees light, it goes into the excited state, but that energy stays in the excited state longer than most normal molecules. And that long-lived excited state gives us a, a better chance of capturing that energy, that excited, that potential energy, so that it can be transferred throughout the molecule. So what, we've dis and the, what we did is we found a structure that matched up with my structures so that it would create a more complicated structure, and that's a lot of structures in one sentence. Um, so something that looks like this, and again, it gets more and more complex. But again, now we're talking about those disks. One thing we figured out is if maybe if we put these bridges in between, not only can we count on the forces that make these molecules stack on top of each other, but we have another way of programming these molecules to be an exact configuration so we know exactly how they're aligned so we can better understand how energy. And this is kind of an ongoing project that I'm talking about. This hasn't been done yet. This is, um, it works on paper great. In the flask it works not as well. But, but we're working on this type. This is the type, these are the types of projects we're working on. Another thing we're working on is creating sensors. Now the idea of a sensor is that you can have a, something, a molecule, and you can put a stimulus in there, whatever you want to detect, and that molecule will change. And the easiest thing to detect is a change in color. So let's say you wanted to go taste, test wastewater, and you wanted to test it for mercury ions. You wanted to be able to stick your, molecule, or stick your wastewater onto your molecule, and your molecule changes colors, and that tells you, oh, there's mercury in there. Okay, so something as simple as you could stick it in there tells you that something's present. And it could be mercury, cadmium, um, chemical, biological weapons, anything that you'd be interested in detecting, you can make a sensor for it. So that's another use for 
our molecules, is what we do is we create these molecules that are similar to the other molecules we've created, and they absorb a circuit and frequency. I put, made this yellow not because it's easy to see, because it's ridiculously hard to see on an overhead slide, but because that's what color the molecule actually is in solution, is it's yellow. But when you put a metal in here, like silver, it turns to this dark red. So it's really easy to tell when there's metal in there. Now, this, this isn't a great system because it does this with a lot of different metals. If you were trying to detect uh, mercury, you wouldn't want the color change if there was iron in the water, too, because it's not going to tell you anything valuable. It's just going to tell you there's some metal in there. Okay, so this system, in particular, isn't useful for detecting any...